Coming up next is a man who, it was overheard earlier today that someone wanted him to sign their shoe before the end of the night. He is an expert on barefoot running, and his focus recently has been on the two ends of the body, the feet and the head. Speaking about making the world smaller, the chair of the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology. Now let's welcome Daniel Lieberman. Thank well, thank you very much. So uh, since I study why and how the human body is the way it is, when I was invited here to, to, to Harvard Thinks Big, I thought, well, maybe I should talk about why so many people are so big. <laughs> so in particular, <laughs> And I'm, as you can tell, I'm going to get myself in serious hot water tonight. So I'm going to try to take an evolutionary biology fr uh, framework, an evolu evolutionary biology perspective to this problem and ask what we should do and what we can do about the problem of obesity. Now, pretty much every, everyone in this room is probably pretty aware of this, this, this so-called epidemic of obesity. When I was born, about 30% of the United States was overweight. But in the time that I've been alive, the percentage of people who are obese or extremely obese has actually tripled. So now, two out of three Americans are either overweight or obese, which is a, a lot of uh, pretty large people. And what's even more scary is childhood obesity. Today, about 35% of American children are overweight, and other countries are quickly catching up with us. So the World Health Organization estimates by the year 2015, about three billion people across the globe will be technically obese. That's a lot of uh, very large uh, belts that are gonna be required. So that's what you should be investing in. But <laughs> there's a lot of debate about this. There are people who say that people like me are alarmists and they're right that being overweight in and of itself is not a disease. You can be overweight and completely healthy, particularly if you exercise a lot. But I think they're missing the point because being overweight or obese is not really a disease, that's true, but it's a symptom of a chronic uh, problem, a long-term energy imbalance. And so that's the real problem and I wanna talk to you a little bit about it. So what do I mean? Well, when you eat something like, uh, like an apple or more likely a piece of pizza or a Twinkie, there's really three things that you can do with that energy, right? You can either put it towards maintaining your body, you can do it towards reproducing, though I don't see many of you probably are reproducing yet, or you can grow. And if you're not growing up, you start growing out. And humans are really good at growing up because we really evolved to store as much fat as we can, as I'll show you in a second. But it's that long-term energy imbalance which really is what makes us sick. So it leads to diseases like type 2 diabetes, it leads to various kinds of heart conditions, it leads to uh, various kinds of cancer like breast cancer. And so the reason that these various diseases are all rising as waistlines are expanding is because they're related to this problem of energy imbalance. But that's really another lecture. So there's lots of finger pointing going on about why this is the case. And we all know really the proximate causes, right? We, uh, you know, good food is more expensive than uh, junk food. Uh, we, um, we don't sleep enough. We drink all this wretched soda, well, portions are getting big, we have no time to exercise, we load our foods with all kinds of crap. And so this is true, these are the proximate explanations, but they don't explain why it is we're so subject to these problems in the first place. And also, why is it that so many of the, of the methods we use to try to correct this problem are failing? And for that, we need to turn to evolution. And I strongly believe, the more I study biology, in fact, the more strongly I believe that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, a very famous phrase written by this guy, Theodosius Dobzhansky. So how can we use evolution to think about this problem? Well, we could go back millions of years, but to spare you a few, few hours, we'll go back to six million years ago to when our lineage diverged from the chimpanzees. And for the first few million years of our evolution, we were basically bipeds who ate fruit a lot. Kind of boring, actually. But around two and a half million years ago, we became hunter-gatherers, and we started getting big brains. And that lasted until very recently. It was only 600 generations ago that we invented farming, and only a few generations ago that we started becoming industrialists. And all that had very massive effects on our human body. If you were a hunter-gatherer today, you would have walked nine to 15 kilometers, or run that distance, actually, and you would have spent several hours digging and climbing trees and doing various other physical activities. You would have eaten a diet of tubers and nuts and fruits and game, which is actually low in saturated fat. And actually, we, talk, we, we often think that life in the Paleolithic was uh, sort of nasty, brutish, and short, but actually that's not true. Hunter-gatherers tend to be very tall, and they actually tend to, they survive infancy, they have high infant mortality rates, but if they survive infancy, they actually tend to live pretty long. 
And because of our big brains, hunter-gatherers are also pretty good at being fat by the standards of other animals. So all humans are obese from the perspective of a chimpanzee because we actually pack on a lot of fat, about 15% in a typical hunter-gatherer female, so we can pay for those big brains and those very um, expensive energy budgets. So we're designed to love to eat as much as we can. But everything changed with the origins of agriculture because farmers had to work pretty hard, but they started producing a lot more calories through, through producing cereals and other, other very starchy grains. And it was then, because of the low nutrient quality of those foods, although they're high caloric quality, um, and also the fact that we had high population density and we started living cheek by jowl with animals, that we started getting lots of diseases and getting sick. In fact, really things went to hell in a handbasket with the origins of agriculture. People became much shorter, lifespans decreased, mortality rates increased, and it's only very recently since the invention of, 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 of um, you know, uh, pasteurization and sterilization and various other and medicines that we've actually improved uh, the quality of our life. But look at you guys, you're all sitting, right? None of you, how many of you ran or walked nine to 15 kilometers a day or dug up any tubers? Well, one of you did, okay. But the rest of you didn't. Um, we really changed our lives. And we, we also eat processed industrial food. And of course, we're living tall, we're getting tall, and we're living very long, but we're also paying some prices. So one of them is that we are, we have now quite an energy balance. If you do some simple calculations, you can, it turns out that today, most of us take in between three and 900 calories more than our great grandparents. And of course, this leads to a wide variety of diseases. And what do we do with these diseases? Well, we treat them, right? We have actually, if any of you have type two diabetes or osteoporosis or high blood pressure, there are a lot of wonderful pharmaceuticals out there which you can buy, which help uh, make you uh, live longer and live, live a healthier life. And if you have problems with your heart, you can get uh, coronary bypass surgery, you can get a gastric bypass, and if you have one of the 25% of people in this room with flat feet, we can give you an orthotic, and we can do all sorts of things to help make you uh, do better uh, and live that long and healthy life that you want to live. But the problem with all those treatments is that they're treating just the symptoms of the diseases, not the causes. And as a result, we're creating a kind of positive feedback loop in which we pr allow um, people to live relatively long lives, but with a fair amount of suffering, which we have to alleviate. But the cost of that is we don't lessen the prevalence of those diseases in the first place. Many of them are still rising, as I showed you earlier. And it's also extremely costly. We today spend 16% of the gross domestic product on healthcare, and as these chronic diseases rise, you know that that figure is gonna go up and up and up. So what are we gonna do about this? Well, how can we use evolution to think about this problem. Remember, nothing in evolution, including the energy imbalance, makes sense uh, outside, nothing in biology makes sense outside the light of evolution. So if we think about evolution by natural selection, Darwin's great idea, all of us have variations, right? And then, then well, it's not so much the case today, but for most of human evolutionary history, there was a struggle for survival. And those of us with variations that helped us survive and reproduce were more likely to pass on those variations, and that gave us adaptations. So we didn't evolve to like exercising. We didn't evolve to like celery. Anybody here like celery? Um, but what we, what we evolved, we evolved to like resting. We evolved to love fat, sugar, and salt, to pack on as much fat as we could to pay for those big babies of ours. Um, but we had to exercise, and we had to eat the various kinds of wild foods that our ancestors ate. And those have-tos gave us all those adaptations which our bodies are loaded with. And the problem is that recently, another game, Monopoly, has um, allowed us to now indulge those urges and cravings to an extent that natural selection never expected, right? So now we're able to uh, become, uh, to eat as much of this stuff as we want, to rest as much as we want, to take elevators up to the fifth floor of the Peabody, to do all these sorts of amazing things, but it makes us sick. So what are our options? Well, one option is to do really what a lot of us are doing today, which is to try to find new treatments to deal with these diseases, right? So we can develop develop better drugs, and we can develop better therapies, and we can figure out ways to deliver healthcare better to people in need. And of course, we should be doing that. But I think that's a kind of depressing future. So uh, not unlike Wally. So another option, right, is to, is to try education. And that's what we do here at Harvard a lot. We want to give people more information so they can make better and more informed choices, right? But that's actually a tall order because it's very, you know, we evolved to love this stuff. We evolved to eat those Twinkies when they're sitting in front of us. Um, we evolved to take, to love to take the elevator if we can. Um, and so we're, we're, we're trying to counter some very deep and primal urges. In addition, very well-meaning um, uh, efforts like Michelle Obama's Let's Move um, 
are, are being drowned out by other uh, aspects of our society, such as the $2 billion that are spent every year by American companies marketing food to children. And that's just to children alone. It's hard to compete with that kind of money. So our final option is to use, is to substitute the struggle for survival with coercion, right? So in the old days, you know, probably if you were able to take a time machine, go back a few million years, right, you'd probably never hear a Neanderthal or Homo erectus or some caveman parent telling his child, now little thag, you have to exercise and you have to eat your roots and tubers. Because little thag had to eat his roots and tubers and exercise because otherwise he'd die, right? <laughs> that was life, right? There was no choice in the matter, right? But nowadays, we have choices, right? So now parents tell their kids what to eat and how to exercise, right? We've replaced that struggle for survival with parental input, right? We tell our kids and our schools tell us and our governments tell us what we ought to do. It's not that we listen to them, of course, but they tell us, right? And well, as you all know, the Supreme Court and Mitt Romney have told us that corporations are people too. So, <laughs> so I think we should start treating corporations just like we treat our children. We should start telling them what to do because after all, their self-interest is not aligned with the self-interest of society. Now, if this sounds radical or crazy, actually, I don't think it is, right? We actually have been doing this for a long time. And we, we you know, require car manufacturers to put seat belts in their cars, and we require parents to put their kids in seat belts. We require all children to have educations. We require them to have immunizations. We prevent kids from doing things that are harmful to themselves, like drinking and smoking. And so I would ask, is requiring people to exercise any different, really, qualitatively or quantitatively from requiring people to to not drink or to, uh, when they're five years old, or to have an immunization. In fact, Harvard used to do this just to people like you. How many of you know that Harvard used to have a physical education requirement? It was actually started in 1920, and it existed all the way up until 1970, where apparently, according to the secretary of the faculty, there was a vote in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences with no discussion, and the physical education requirement was just dissolved. Just like that, faculty vote. But it was actually a pretty serious requirement. You had to actually do four hours of physical education per week. So actually, it's pretty good. So I'd like to end with a few thoughts. The first is that really it's not about how overweight you are or how obese you are. It's really your energy balance that probably really matters biologically. Secondly, I think we should continue to advance medical treatments, and we can sh should continue to try to inform and educate people. But remember that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, and that includes the obesity epidemic. And since we can't change our biology, we're going to have to change the environment in which we live. And so instead of thinking big, maybe we should think small, and maybe we should think actually a little bit local. And I'd like to propose that here at Harvard we can do something um, to replace uh, what used to be the case in our environments and require physical education again. Thank you very much.